and welcome back for another episode. Today is very exciting because guess what? We're not doing paint work for once. We're actually talking about all the parts that I've acquired over time and how we are going to build this, I guess you could call it, budget 2JZ. Once you add up the prices of all these parts, the cost is still relatively significant. But in the grand scheme of things, building cars, building Supras, this is a very budget friendly option. And I'm gonna run you through exactly every single part I bought, why I bought it, and obviously the cost of it, you can just fucking Google. So let's get into it. All right, so I have to talk about the foundation or the bottom end before we get to all the parts. And I've decided to use a 2JZ GE bottom end. This is actually out of a naturally aspirated vehicle. And I'll explain why for the financial and the practical reasons behind it. So this came out of my dad's 1983 or 1994 Mark IV Supra, which is target top, naturally aspirated and automatic. So no matter how long you thrash an automatic naturally aspirated car for, sooner or later that will become boring. And during the life of 180,000 kilometers that this engine was in the car, we don't see any consider, we, I don't see any wear actually. Like these bores are mint. It's got 180,000 Ks, it's a 2JZ. I really don't think there is much to stress about and I think we're off to a really good start. In a moment, I will talk about the differences between the naturally aspirated and the turbo engines and why the extra or the massive difference in price is not worth going to the 2JZ GT engines, instead why you should stick to the GE non-VVTi because the non-VVTi has the same connecting rods as the turbo motors, the VVTi naturally aspirated engines, in the other hand, have a thinner rod, which isn't ideal for boost and turbo applications. So, a uh, bit of a backstory behind the Supra, because I know there will be questions. We're taking body panels off it, we're taking the engine out of it. So what's happened to a running car that's now become a parts car is the green car uh, sort of started the project last minute and there's a lot, lot to learn on that car. Don't think that car will stay in the family as long as the target top. So you, I figured, you know what? This is a great engine. I'm more than happy for this to stay in the target top, but if we're planning on keeping the car in the family for a long amount of time and we want to make it reliable and we want to, you know, play around with it, further learn, it's a perfect base to actually build an engine, potentially buy a brand new bottom end from Toyota or even V12 swapper if Tristan comes to the table. So Tristan, comment below. We want a V12 on the Supra Twin Turbo. So. Anyways, that's sort of the practical and the financial reasoning behind it. Now, the major differences in the bottom ends is everything is the same except oil squirters and pistons for the most part. The crank between naturally aspirated and turbo is the same. Non-VVTi naturally aspirated con rods and turbo con rods are the same. The blocks are the same with the exception of the naturally aspirated block has no oil squirters under the pistons. Now, I'll just touch subject. This might be a rumor, I might be wrong, I might be right, comment below, is when you don't have the oil squirters, the oil doesn't actually tee off to the squirter that goes under the piston, it goes directly to the main bearings and you end up having high oil pressure. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm correct. Yeah, some people like that for high horsepower builds as well. And lastly, the pistons are made of the same cast or the same material, but they are a higher compression. Now you're thinking, turbo application, higher compression, probably not an ideal thing probably better to stick with the turbo engine and that's why it's worth more. And that isn't entirely correct because nowadays we are living in 2021 and we have a lot of alcohol-based fuels. We've got ethanol, we've got the best ECUs we've ever had, we've got the best tuners that are able to control these ECUs we have ever had. So having a high compression engine actually isn't a big deal. I'm pretty sure the factory 2JZ turbo engines are a nine to one compression ratio, while the naturally aspirated are a 10 to one compression ratio. Take it, do keep in consideration that the real street Supras that you see running six and seven second passes run 10 to one compression ratio um, engines. Now, however, when we do run the thicker head gasket being the three layer multi-layer Toyota 2JZ GT head gasket, along with the GT cylinder head, that compression ratio will also slightly change. So we will have to measure that. And I will let you guys know in the near future what that compression ratio ends up being. But I think approximately 9.8 to one is the number that it's going to end up at according to the forums. Bottom end sorted, let's move on to the cylinder head. All right, so the first part I'm going to be unboxing is actually a brand new drum roll. 2JZ GTE VVTi cylinder head directly from Toyota. 
This one specifically I brought from City Toyota here in Perth. If you're anywhere in Australia and you need genuine parts from Toyota, you know who to email, all right? Thank you, Elliot, shout out. Now, you guys already know, I'm straight to the point, I swear. I've got an opinion if I'm going to share it with you guys. You know, it might make your life easier, it might open your eyes about something, but just one thing I wanna say, look, Toyota never made a great looking car, let's be honest. But they made a lot of reliable cars, they're very good to their customers, and seriously, to your, uh, Nissan, you bunch of dogs, this is what's going to make me want to buy a brand new Hilux one day and not a freaking Nissan Navara, is the support. Toyota made arguably their best car, the Toyota Supra, 25, 30 years ago, right? So they made this car and they have, they made a lot of them. They were sold all over the world and a lot of the Supra owners that, you know, you see the big builds also have deep pockets. Whether they spend 50 grand on the build or they spend 75 or 100, for them it's probably not that big of a difference. But for the smaller guys such as myself, whether you spend $2,000 or $4,000 on the cylinder head might matter. So for them to be able to accommodate a massive range of different people and to be able to supply such a legendary cylinder head or an engine component for a very reasonable price that is brand new, that literally arrived within five to seven business days, to me is mental. Nissan, all the good parts that they have, they see a pool of people, the GDR owners, they're gonna spend the money anyways. So let's make their life worse and put it under the bullshit Nismo Heritage Program and let's bump up the prices so they pay more and so we retrieve higher profits. While Toyota goes, no, this is at the end of the day is a piece of metal that we built once upon a time and let's just have it available for the general public to service their vehicles or maybe even potentially upgrade the vehicles such as I'm doing. The actual technical reasoning behind purchasing the cylinder head is because the resale value, anything GTE, even though it is a not, it's, it's not a, originally an RZ or a turbo car, having turbo components or factory turbo components in the long run when you decide to sell the car one day is definitely a great thing to have because everybody wants uh, true GT, nobody wants a GE plus T unless you're really keeping it for, for yourself. So for me, this was a logical option. I live in Australia. The cost of labor is very expensive. So for me to actually get the cylinder head, the GE factory one reconditioned, skimmed and all that is a very expensive exercise to the point where it's actually worth just buying a brand new cylinder head that is already skimmed. Obviously we need to put a lot of valve frame components in the cylinder head that we would have done anyways, so it's not really an added cost. And also, we have the luxury of using the factory GT intake manifold, which I paid $100 for. I paid $100 for the GT intake manifold, which is awesome. It has long runners for, for our low down torque. It looks good and it'll do the job. I will adapt the drive bar wire system to it, so obviously we're not going to have a cable throttle anymore and it's going to be controlled through our ECU and that is also a massive cost saving right there. That I'm able to buy somebody's intake manifold that they was, weren't using, adapt it to my brand new GT cylinder head instead of going out of pocket 12 or 1300 bucks for a shitty Chinese intake manifold that everybody rebrands, you know, that's going to crack in the future, that's probably not the greatest looking thing, that has short runners, that's not applicable for my application. Instead, the factory one is a better and cheaper unit. Moving on, the valve covers. The valve covers, I would need to modify, I would need to pay somebody to TIG weld a couple of brackets or swap out a couple of brackets for me to be able to run the GT valve covers on the GE engine. Again, that is labor, that is money. Here in Australia, labor is very expensive. So that is also another thing that you need to get done. Lastly, the GE cylinder head uses a distributor. It does not have coil packs. So this engine, factory came out with coil packs. Everything is there in place for you to run coil packs instead of a ugly distributor that is more reliable, more efficient, and looks better as well. So that is my reasoning behind buying a brand new 2JZ GT VVTi cylinder head, plus the VVTi, great for the street, low down torque, mid range, should help out a bunch. Let's get it. There we go. 
So as you can see from factory, this comes very bare. It's got no valve stem seal. All it has is the factory cam caps that come with it. That's it. So you're gonna have to fill this in with um, valve springs, retainers, valves, um, a valve stem seals, camshafts. We can reuse the factory GE sprocket here and we'll just order a brand new GTE VVTI sprocket here. Cylinder head, boom, we're done. It's faced, it's brand new, it's clean. Like there's honestly nothing to worry about. Buckets and shims, we are going to reuse out of the GE head. We'll re-shim it accordingly. So obviously the valve train is nice and happy and we don't have any ticking noises. And the head, very nice and simple. It is done. <sighs> I've never done this much talking, but I hope you appreciate the information. All right, with the cylinder head on the engine, we can pack away the box. Toyota, you've served us well. Next up. We've got a package from Golby's Parts. Literally every single manifold, exhaust manifold I've ever purchased except one was from Golby's. Very nice and easy. Just order it online. They have it custom made to your spec and it's your way. This time around, I sent a bit of an email and I was like, look boys, we've purchased a fair few manifolds. I've got this shitty project going on. Do you boys want to come and support the show a little bit? So they gave me a little bit of a discount. So yeah, nothing really to talk about here. Six boost manifold, high mount for a 2JZ GTE. The flange is completely different, or the bolt hole patterns, to a GE, so make sure that you order the manifold that is suited for your cylinder head. This, I'll just quickly run through it. It's mild steel, it's thick, it doesn't crack, it's equal length, so you've got the good sound. You can convert your SR20 sounding from a shitty engine to a little bit less shitty engine. Um, if you have a JZ or an RB, you can definitely transform it from sounding from a decent engine to a very good sounding engine. And this time around, brother, we're updating the tech around here. No more T3, T4. We are going for a V-band. This particular one is a, a Garrett V-band style. And obviously that is for a 50 mil wastegate, which hasn't arrived yet because I ordered it a little bit late. Also from Gobby's. It is a Turbo Smart Gen 5 uh, 50 mil black turbo wastegate. I think the best flowing one in the market. And this is just like a little elbow for it to get welded onto the manifold. Also comes with brand new studs and nuts. So let's get on the engine. Well, here we go. You've got this dilly here. Don't need it just yet. Put it aside. And yeah. Honestly, we're just, uh, j just using this for fabrication at this stage. So obviously, we don't have a head gasket, we don't have anything in the cylinder head. And then the engine comes out for its final cleanup, reseal, reassemble, and then it can actually go in the green car for some wiring. And then we got to go brum brum, motherfuckers. So yeah, that'll do. Three studs is heaps. Um, yeah, I might actually put another two. Here we go. Just nip it up. All right, moving on. Every uh, turbo exhaust manifold needs a turbo. So this time around, I've purchased a brand new Pulsar turbo. It is the G35 1050 with the 0.83 uh, rear housing. It is all V-band, and we've got the T51R mod, which I'll show you in a second. It comes really well packaged, and I just want to give a massive shout out to BTEC from Scotland. Um, the guy's an absolute legend, answers all my questions that I have, and he's really the person that exposed me to the world of DCTs and Pulsar turbos. So, look, at the end of the day, if there's a cheaper alternative, I'd rather go with that. If it's reliable, if it makes the power, look, we're not building race cars, and even if we were, uh, knowing me and how stubborn I am, I would not go with a reputable brand. Instead, I would go with, you know, someone that's newer to the market, such as Pulsar, to see if it worked, because if it does, at the end of the day, you are saving yourself a significant amount of money. And for a street car, this is more than we will ever need. So, very well packaged. Okay. 
Jesus, how many freaking plastics. Save the turtles, eh? Um, yeah, there's the T51R mod. It's a ball bearing turbo. And man, this thing is really well machined. Comes with all the fittings except the oil drain, which is also nice. So I don't know much about turbos and don't know if I can give you an exactly scientific reasoning of it on the bench, but here's the T51R mod. It looks very nicely machined, like good bit of kit, especially for the cost. Like these things are so freaking cheap. And it's got a V-band for the exhaust manifold. It's got a V-band for the um, dump pipe. And yeah, that's about it. I've heard good things about them. It'll definitely suit our streetcar application more than more than enough. And the only thing I'm very interested to see is the T51R mod. Is it going to be too loud for my liking? I'm a little bit particular, a little bit anal with things. Once I ordered it, I was like, oh, might have not, maybe I shouldn't have got the T51R mod. But once the car's running, I'll tell you exactly what I think about it. But I do think I'm gonna like it. So let's get the turbo on the engine. So I might as well show you what comes in the packet. You've got your three inch V-band for the exhaust manifold. So you've got the clamp and you've got a V-band that you weld onto your actual pipe. And then for the manifold part, you've got the V-band for clamping it on. Obviously my manifold already has a V-band welded on, so we will not be needing the one supplied, but instead I'm going to put it in a drawer and we'll probably need it eventually. And the whole idea behind V-band is, whoa, spinny, spinny. Nearly lost it, mate. So what I've done is just put four factory washers and then I'll put four factory bolts just on the front and the end of the cylinder head just so it doesn't come off the block once I bolt on the turbo because there is a significant amount of weight on that side. At the end of the day, what's important to me is that the part is reliable and that it is affordable. Now, often those two don't really go together, but we are living in 2021 where things seem to be a lot more affordable than they used to be and a hell of a lot more reliable than they also used to be when it comes to performance engines. So here we go. V-band was chosen just to make my life a little bit easier, even though as you can see, I'm still struggling. There we go. And I'm pretty sure they do make a, um, like a reverse rotation, so this side would actually come out there, which might better suit the Jay-Z engine because the hot side is actually on the opposite side of the RB engines, but everybody's photos that I've seen online with turbochargers, this seems to be the rotation that they have chosen, so I just did the same. the turbo out of the way so while we're still talking about the engine we might as well quickly switch subject and just the light light flex boys light flex brand new series 2 tail lights look once again I'm not gonna go on an emotional journey about Toyota and their care for their customers but did I buy series 2 Toyota Supra brand new tail lights or did I buy Camry tail lights like I could build three Supras for the cost of one GTR, and I'm not even joking. I'm genuinely not kidding. Elliot, once again, shout out, CD Toyota, hulking it up. Um. All right, moving on, we have our cooling. So this is just a stencil in here, and I think a hat. Hold up, yep, you got me hat, mate. Cheers, boys. I don't really wear hats, but We'll rock it for the sake of the video. And we got a shop flag. Another shop flag. We got some freaking bottle openers. I already know who I'm gonna gift these to. And lastly, we have a stencil for when the intercooler arrives. Just psh, psh, a bit of white and then mark it as Phoenix. All right, moving to the actual exciting part except the bottle openers, they're probably a bit more exciting than a radiator. So this is Phoenix Radiators, boys over at New Zealand. So 
if you're ordering anything, go on their actual New Zealand, not the Australian website. That's Everything's up to date with uh, different vehicles, different products, and then I, I guess just order it through there because their Australian website isn't as up to date. So, yes. Oh, mate. Damn. You boys are absolute freaking alcoholics, eh? Look at this. Stubby holder, mate. All right. I mean, I know that it's all about keeping it cool, but nice. Alright, so there's nothing overly exciting about a radiator, but as long as it keeps the car cool, it'll keep the car on the road, and once we tra travel across the Nullarbor, Nullarbor is the longest strait in the world, pretty much through the middle of Australia, our island or desert as you may call it. As long as it keeps the car cool doing that, this radiator's done its trick, and it's black, stealth, it'll just match in with the rest of the engine bay, and then we can have the engine and another couple little things just sort of pop in your face and highlight it all. So, happy days. We're making a bit of a mess out here. So, all right, so I just want to cover this real quick. This is the factory 2JZ GT. I don't know if this is a VVTI or a non VVTI intake manifold. I don't even know if there's any differences to be honest. But what I was planning on doing is, or what I'm going to do, is I'm going to remove the factory throttle body, this big chunky thing, throw it in the bin, and then buy myself a little billet adapter. And what that does is it adapts a Bosch Motorsport drive by wire throttle body either a 68 or a 70, uh, 74 mil. And then I've got luxurious features such as cruise control and everything else once I pair it up with a chosen ECU, which I still haven't decided on. Great thing about this is, as I said, it cost me a hundred bucks. People have these things laying around that they might have upgraded from something else. And again, a very underrated manifold. I don't exactly know why you would want to upgrade. It's a good looking manifold. And as you see these runners here, this is what gives you torque. The long runner gives you torque for a street car with the VVTI and the size turbo we have with the small rear housing. This thing and the three liter capacity, man, I really think on paper that this should really be a very nice street car. Another couple, obviously I'll tidy all that up, throw a couple of things in the bin that we don't need once we go drive by wire and the fuel rail, throw it in the bin and replace it with a Raceworks fuel rail, some injectors and we are good to go back on the engine. Get it vapor honed so it's all nice fresh cast aluminium, a no brainer. Now one of the bigger reasons I decided to go for the factory one is as I mentioned, I can either go for a shitty like a Chinese replica like I did on my Skyline and the short runner doesn't really give you the torque. Now, as I said, this is a three liter capacity engine so we sh and the VVTi, we should get a lot more out of it than an RB25 for example. But if this is already readily, re readily available for a couple of hundred bucks, why wouldn't you do it? As I mentioned, the reason I went 2JZ GT cylinder head resale value and the simplicity when it comes to bolt-ons. The exhaust manifold, no worries. Whether you order a six boost GE or GT, all they do is just change out the flanges and the job is done. But the actual bolt pattern on both the intake and the exhaust side of the non-turbo versus the turbo cylinder head is completely different. So you cannot bolt on this turbo intake manifold on your non-turbo cylinder head without an adapter. So I've decided just to, you know what, bite the bullet, buy that brand new cylinder head. As I said, there's a lot of components in the long run that make your life easier and that you do save on, where the cylinder head in the long run doesn't actually cost you anything to buy. $100? My next alternative is if I stayed for the GE. Uh, there are a couple of cheaper alternatives, but if you want to go something that's also aesthetically pleasing, your cheapest option is to either go for like a Chinese knockoff. They're about a thousand to thirteen hundred bucks, just like I had on the Skyline. Short runner, uh, prone to cracking, not ideal. Wouldn't recommend it. Wouldn't use it again ever. Yeah, the standard one. Also long runner. You get torque for up to a thousand horsepower. I'm pretty sure people run these things, no worries. They're a good looking manifold as well. OEM plus, clean it up, vapor hone the aluminium. Man, I'm telling you, this super build, super basic, super cruisy, parts nice and available, nice and affordable. Very enjoyable build to do, I'd say.
So, yeah, just not as good sounding as an RB. Boom! Easy as that. And finally, the chosen gearbox and the adapter in here is the TR6060, which is a pretty much all the T56 or TR6060 transmissions are very, very same, same, but different. I'm gonna link a video from Joel Grannis in the description below that compares them all so you get a very nice understanding of the differences and maybe the pros and the cons. He personally wasn't a massive fan of the TR6060 because it's got an external shifter and other added costs. But for us in Australia, by the time we pay shipping for items from the US that suit the conversion and everything else. This is an exception for us where it's actually worth going down the route of the TR6060. It's a readily available transmission that came in the V Commodores for us. For you guys, might have come in the Camaros or whatever. At the end of the day, it's all Chevy, so it doesn't really matter. It's got very strong gears. I don't think I'll break the transmission. And the only thing that really put me off a TR6060 is the gearing. The first four gears are sort of like any other gearbox. But the fifth and sixth, we have two overdrives. We live in Australia. We have speed limits of 100 to 110 kilometers per hour on big roads, which is stupid, but what do you do? I don't make the rules. So really the car's only ever gonna live in fourth and fifth gear on the freeway. Sixth gear is completely out of the picture because we'd be on the freeway at like 1500 to 2000 RPM and the thing would just try and die and bog down. So what do we have here? We have a custom flywheel. So this just bolts up to the back of the engine. It's already got the correct ring gear for the starter motor. All right, pretty simple bit of kit. Now this one in particular is the Castle Main Performance uh, or Castle Main Rod Shop. This flywheel was 450 Aussie dollars. Moving on, the adapter. The adapter was about 650. So it's a cast aluminium, which is really nice. I just bolted one up, because obviously we have two, one for my mate, one for myself. And yeah, it bolted right up, like easy as. We're gonna pass engineering with this, it looks good. And another advantage of the aluminium barrel housing is, the thing I've heard about the guys complaining in the US when they go T T56 transmissions with a metal barrel housing, is it vibrates, it echoes, it transmits all the vibrations from the engine into the gearbox, into the chassis of the car, compared to aluminium, a different style of metal that might absorb the sound a little bit better. This is definitely our chosen option. Now, as for the shifter, I will get to it. Oh, there's also a spigot bush that comes in this kit that, here we go, spigot bush. As for the shifter, it's an external shifter, so, and it's chassis mounted, so we're gonna have to modify that slightly. Obviously, as the videos start pumping out, I will show you guys the process of that as well. So if you're doing this at home, you can replicate the process. And as you guys know, I think about everything 222 times, and then I make a decision based on my thoughts, whether it be, you know, I don't always go for the cheapest option, but I don't always go for the most expensive option. Whatever is going to pay off in the long run, in terms of resale, in terms of reliability, and in terms of satisfaction of me and, my, and the build, that is what I usually choose. Now, as for the Skyline, that's a completely different story. I'm like a freaking bipolar girl. I don't even know what I want to do with that. So, we're gonna have to leave that project for another day. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, make your mind up on what you want to do. If you've enjoyed the video, leave us a thumbs up, leave a comment what you want to see in the future, and we'll see you guys next video when we put the engine in the car.